Um, <clears throat> so welcome to everybody and welcome to everybody on the webcast as well. Um, Mark, may I ask you to read out the emergency evacuation procedure, please? Yes, Chair, that's no problem. Um, if the continuous alarm does sound, you must evacuate the building and proceed to the assembly point. From this room, you follow the green running person signs to the exit, using either the marble staircase or the main staircase. Please do not use the lifts. The assembly point for this building is the Orange Grove roundabout, um, just outside the Brown's restaurant. There is an evacuation chair for use by disabled people who so wish in the corridor outside the council chamber public gallery. Alternatively, the area at the top of the marble staircase has been designated a safe refuge where persons needing assistance should assemble. Thank you very much. Um, can I please remind everybody to turn their phones to silent? Uh, Mark, are there any um, apologies for absence or any substitutions? Um, no, no, I've received, Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest that anybody would like to make? No declarations? Great. So, um, is, there is no um, urgent business to be agreed or has been agreed at? Um, but we do have a statement um, from a councillor, and I think there's just the one, isn't there, Mark? Right. So um, there's a statement from uh, Councillor Karen Walker and Councillor Sarah Bevan, which I will read out. Um, and it's concerning the 2022-23 budget. Will Pease Down St John be included? Dear panel members, each year we see millions of pounds being spent on numerous projects across the local authority, all of which are carried out with a desire to invest in our communities and to improve the quality of life of our residents. We are grateful that the council uses a budget setting and discussion process that allows all councillors to contribute and make representations on behalf of their constituents. It is for this very reason that we're submitting this statement and these items for consideration in the 2023 Council Budget. Each week we spend time out in the community knocking on doors, meeting residents and finding out what the desires and aspirations are for Pease Down St John. This is their wish list for the forthcoming Council Budget. And I'll send this um, over to Mark so that um, panel members and officers can see this. So they're requesting £50,000 for Braze Down Lane resurfacing. £15,000 for Carlingcott resurfacing, £50,000 for, for Wellow Meadow resurfacing, and £20,000 for hedge maintenance and path clearance. Please do consider these financial requests from Pease Down St John residents for the 2022-23 um, council budget. It does actually say for the 2019-20 council budget in the statement, but I, I think that might just be a, a typing error. So that's from Councillor Walker and um, Councillor uh, Sarah Bevan. And I'll send that. I think you've got a copy of that, haven't you, Mark? Great. So um, item number seven are the minutes um, from the last meeting on the 27th of September. Does anybody have any comments to make on the minutes? I may, Chair. Yes, certainly. Um, the comment I raised about the pedestrian crossing that should have been involved in Western Riverside, it's in the minutes, and it said the officer stated that we'll be double check on this um, and get back to me. I don't think I, have, I, I may have missed the email, but I'm sure no one got back to me about it. Right, okay. Um, is that one that you can take, Andy? Yeah, great, lovely. Yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah. That's too, sorry, so, yeah. Yeah, that's no, that's fine. Pedestrian crossing that was promised as part of the 106 agreement with Western Riverside. Simon will know it very well. We've had an email exchange over many years, haven't we, Simon? <laughs> um, and uh, it's still not delivered. But the money has been handed over, I believe. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. So can I have a proposal for the minutes, please? Sally is proposing. May I have a seconder, please? Alistair, please. So um, item eight is the cabinet member update. Our cabinet member um, is not able to be with us today. 
So I don't know if any of the officers have any briefings for us or whether we move on. Um, I think in terms of things that I'll update, I'll incorporate it into my presentation. Okay. All right. Okay. So then, um, item number nine are the draft budget assumptions. And we have um, some um, slides that I think we were all sent earlier anyway. So the panel members have those. Thank you. Over to you, Andy. I'm live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. So um, today's items really a status update in terms of where we are with the financial planning process um, going into setting the 22-23 budget. Um, because really since our last um, update to the panel, which was really broadly linked into our medium-term financial strategy that set out what the challenge is, we're now edging closer in terms of um, coming up with budgetary solutions, but also considering um, areas that the council needs to consider in more detail in terms of um, managing the council's finances going into 22-23 in terms of live issues. So we started to now get into granular detail of budget setting and also building in assumptions around the spending review that I want to touch on. So I'm going to walk everyone through a few slides. The start position is really a reminder of the um, headlines set out in the medium-term financial strategy that showed that our budget in the coming years, really year one and year two, 22-23 and 23-24, is still challenging because we're going through that transition phase in terms of reducing our reliance on external income, which has been and will continue to be infected by COVID. Um, so that creates a budgetary pressure, which has turned itself into a budget gap because our baseline funding has dropped. So that highlights that the gap for next year was 13.12 million and for the following year is 6.41, and as you can see, it starts dropping down into a much more um, balanced position in the future years. That's because the council tax base catches up, where we have annual increases in council tax, and we also factored in to our longer-term plan areas like um, the income from the Roman bars starts incrementally building itself back, but doesn't get back to pre-pandemic levels until we get to around 24-25 which is why the, you can see the gap kind of closing from that income creeping back up into our projections. Since the medium-term financial strategy in September, we've been resetting some of our planning assumptions. So following the spending review on council tax, we've built in the assumption for the next three years that a 1% social care precepts will be applied. Um, that's uh, been you know, really indicated as something that will be put in place for the next three years through the Chan Chancellor's spending review announcement. And also um, what we've been doing is looking at quite detailed areas in terms of inflation on contracts where we've got risk exposure and also areas of um, kind of budget resetting and rebasing where we've got services now that are um, they're costing more money or they've got um, new challenges in terms of demand pressures and that needs to be recognised and factored into the future year's budget. So we've been doing a reset in terms of areas of the council that does need additional funding. And also um, in terms of appropriate use of reserves in terms of some of our mitigations, we've been looking at um, some service reserves that can be also um, freed up to help um, that transition period getting through next financial year. So that's in the final bullet points where we've identified 2.2 million of service reserves, where um, previously in the council approved budget, we did have planned use of 3 million reserves as part of that transition plan from COVID. So I just want to bring that point to the panel's attention. This is um, quite a lot. Of it's still quite a high level, but there are a lot of movements in terms of the numbers. What, what this table shows you is the medium-term financial strategy position of 13.12 million as a budget gap. Where I talked about doing the budget refresh, looking at areas of new funding and also where we need to recognise pressures, that has put in an additional funding requirement of around 4.3 million for next year, and also uh, touched on identifying um, service reserves that can be utilised to help support the budget. That shows the minus 2.22. So what that takes us from is a, a budget gap of 13.12 million to a revised budget gap of 15.18 million. So 
primary way to mitigate that gap is to look at um, savings plans and income generation proposals uh, across all of our portfolios. We've recognised that that was the financial challenge in terms of the targets and been through the exercise of identifying savings plans and also areas where we can look at um, alternative income generation and we've got a set of proposals that's been through an internal assurance process and we're roughly working on about 12.3 million. We're still at the planning stage so those numbers might move a little bit. Um, we've been through um, budget insurance, assurance and budget review meetings that have, um, we did have a broad set of savings on the table and these are the narrowed down ones that are being recommended by portfolio holders and their directors. So these are the ones that will be um, going out to consultation and put forward in the budget proposal. What that leaves us with is a, a budget gap of 2.88 million, so around a 3 million gap to find. What we were keen in terms of setting the budget is really to try and avoid having to go through a reactive um, process of trying to find emergency savings to mitigate that gap. Um, so at the same time, we've been um, looking in more detail in terms of the spending review announcement and factor in some of the um, anticipated changes. Um, I think that probably the core announcement that came to the spending review was an extra 1.6 billion funding to councils to give a, a core spending power increase. What, what that means is um, when you combine business rates, council tax and grant funding, it gives you your core spending power. What the Chancellor has done is um, ensure that councils do have an uplift in core spending power when you combine all of those factors, council tax and grants. So we've built in our assumptions on our allocation of the 1.6 um, billion and that's incorporated into that positive 8 million figure at the um, bottom of the table. Within there, we've also factored in the 1% social care precept, and we've also factored in the extension of the business rates retention pilots, which has a fairly significant figure that will benefit um, next financial year. However, with the spending review, whilst there's positive announcements, there's also the flip side of it, which is um, areas that we'll have to fund. So within the grant allocations, um, I think it's become pretty clear that we all need to fund the increase in national insurance to fund the changes to the health and social care um, investment from government. So that will need to come out. And also, um, we've been recognising different areas of inflationary risk that we're facing. And um, I'm recommending that we put in contingency budgets to recognise risk that might crystallise in 22-23, and also recognise demand on areas like children's social care and adult social care. So whilst we've got positive assumptions around 8 million. There's areas that um, are probably on the highly likely sort of spectrum of risk that should crystallise in at around 5.42 million. I've got more detail on both those figures on the next slide. But this table gives the breakdown of the spending review assumptions. These do have to be caveated because um, we won't have the exact um, figures until we get the provisional settlement from government. We're expecting that around the, um, probably about the mid-December point, around the 13th or 14th of December. And then these numbers will all be refreshed again when we've got our exact local allocations. But based on our sort of intelligent modeling on a couple of different scenarios, we're assuming out of the 1.6 billion, we'll get a recurrent grant of 3.5 million. And the one that we're pretty accurate on is 1% social care precept. This should generate around 1 million. Um, also, the announcement in terms of funding into um, uh, connecting families, that was a budget pressure. That funding has now been announced as recurrent, so that also creates a further benefit of 400K. And then um, we're pretty accurate on the business rates retention pilot um, risk. That was the risk for us was a pressure of 3.2 million if the pilot um, ceased at the end of this financial year. If it continues, it should have a 3.2 million benefit. But the, the risks that we've incorporated is um, across adults and children, we're continuing to see high cost placements coming through. And whilst um, our financial plans do look to mitigate pressures if they can be um, really uh, mitigated through different service delivery models or more affordable placements. We're always going to have a, a risk exposure, so we're putting forward 2 million as a corporately held contingency for adults and children. 
Also, um, with energy contracts and energy tariff prices increasing significantly as we come out of tariffs that were agreed maybe two or three years ago and have to renew contracts, that is going to present a financial risk to the Council because current tariff rates with um, the issues in energy supply are significant and they're going up um, by 20 to 30 per cent from contracts that were agreed two or three years ago. So we have to recognise that and put that forward as a contract risk. And also I mentioned the the cost of the NI increase across our pay bill is 750000 What this doesn't include is um, market exposure risk on contract extensions um, where employers are, um, and providers to the council are increasing their prices to take into account their NI uplifts. That's not something that I believe is going to be funded from government to councils, but it should be picked up by our existing inflation um, budgets that we put in and also some of the corporate contingencies we hold here. And then a final couple of points. Um, in terms of our uh, ongoing business rates projections with um, more um, vacation of shops and retail units in Bath, that does create a business rates risk in terms of our collection. So there's a 500k pressure there. And also, we're not 100% clear at the moment whether the annual new homes bonus grant is wrapped up into the 8.3 million figures above or it will continue as a single grant to the council. So we're recognising that as a risk at the moment because it could be wrapped up in the 3.5 million above. Can I just ask a quick yeah. question on the um, social care budget? Would there be um, would there be any, be any case to increase that to 2% or even 3% as we've done in previous years? Um, on the council tax, it is capped at 1%, so it would involve a local referendum to go above. So it's a, I think it's a mandated 1% increase, where before there was flexibility, so I think it was um, I think it was 6% over three years, and then you could profile it, whether you do 1% and then um, you know, 3% and then a further you know, 2%. Now you've reminded me now. And um, that... Is there still going to be a pressure under social care? Because it just seems that we have an ageing population within Bath and North East Somerset. Is that actually going to be enough, do you think? It, it's, it's really difficult um, to give 100% accuracy when you're profiling on social care. We, we've taken um, our current um, caseload across all of the social care budgets, projected that forward for uplift, and then also... Um, factored in inflation. So we've been as accurate as we can. But I think what... what <laughs> where, where, where we've got a high degree of um, accuracy in the way that we predict our social care pressures next year, um, we generally will put that forward as a uh, funding increase to our base budget but then we'll recognise um, financial risk in terms of our general reserve also if it goes above the kind of, you know, um, the demand that we're predicting. Okay. So this is a graphical representation of our budget profile. I thought it would be helpful to include this because um, in previous presentations, what I've shown is the, the red line, which is our baseline funding, actually being below zero next year. Um, so this is a kind of a good articulation of some of the spending review assumptions where it shows that our baseline funding does go up next year, but also um, on top of our income risk exposure, we are recognising a funding requirement into the council for really um, the economic challenges we're in at the moment in terms of um, employment, pay inflation, contract inflation, that we're facing significant new financial risk on top of income. So still shows in terms of that graph profile we've got a significant gap to mitigate next year and then it becomes more manageable as we go into future years. Um, there is a decrease in base funding as we go into 23-24. Um, That's representing where we've got one-off um, utilisation of reserves dropping out. So that, that's just the graphical representation where it shows we've had that reliance on some one-off money to make that gap um, manageable next year. Because the gap is um, a smaller one, it just shows the reserve dropping out, but then the, the larger increase in the later years is the repayment of those reserves also. So it shows how the financial plan does reimburse reserves that are used to manage that transition period. So 
this is my final slide. It's really just to um, update the panel on some of the key dates. So um, over the last week and this week, there's been area forum engagement sessions. They haven't been 100% budget focused. They've been sessions focused on um, engaging with the area forums on general winter pressures, um, COVID messages from public health and the NHS, and also having a discussion about some of those broader challenges that the council's facing at the moment. And then we'll go into the wider budget engagement session on the 14th of December. Um, the reason for that date is we're hoping to have a little bit more clarity on the, the settlement and we'll get the, the detail um, in the right shape for going through a wider engagement session in terms of some of the, the plans for next year. And then we've got the two sessions with corporate scrutiny in January. Um, the plan with that is to, um, because going through the budget is, is a massive report and trying to do it all in one session, I think as we've discussed before, is um, quite a lot to get through. I think it would be better in January the 10th to go through a lot of the detail around um, savings plans and funding proposals, and then we go through the full budget paper on the 31st, if that's okay, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have, and I think I've expressed it before in some emails, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that we're leaving it to the 31st of, of January to get some of the detail, um, because obviously there are council meetings on the 15th, and it would be like, I mean, if we have, we as a panel have agreed that we're going to be a critical friend, um, so if there are some issues, there won't be much time yeah. to actually turn those around for um, cabinet um, and officers to absorb those and get them changed and through um, council if that is appropriate. So if we can get as much detail on the 10th, um, we'd be very grateful for that. Yeah, my, my plan is that yeah, we, we go through all of the um, detailed budget annexes in terms of adjustments to the budget on the 10th, so we publish them well in advance and then it's the actual full document on the 31st. But we, we cover the, the key detailed points around the savings, investment, and capital program on the 10th. Great, thank you, Andy. Uh, right. Does anybody uh, from the panel have any questions? Andy? If I may, Chair. Yeah, you, you made an assumption early on about 2% um, inflation, and I presume that is salary inflation for yep. staff. Now, hearing what is happening across the country about inflation pressures anyway, is that realistic? Do we think that it should be more than 2%? I think it, it's a really good question because we've, we've been having those conversations. Um, I think like, likelihood in sort of management over the five-year term, 2% um, is probably a reasonable figure. I think what we may have to do is consider a contingency whilst we go through the, the pay settlement conversations because they're still under negotiation for this financial year and I'm sure there'll be you know, a lot more detailed, robust conversations going into the pay settlement for 22-23. So there is that risk that pay inflation in terms of local government pay award and pay general pay award to the public sector could be above 2% next year. It's just a big unknown at the moment. So I think it's something we may need to recognise as a corporate risk on the council. To, to if I may check. Um, so we're saying 2% because that's the national assumption at the moment yeah. across all employers of uh, local government and yeah. um, that's, that's where you've arrived at that figure. Yeah. And the current position is um, in terms of um, pay bargaining is 1.75%. That's the figure that's been put forward through the um, consultation and engagement that's happening with the unions at the moment. So 2% feels like a, a safe figure to use. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Davis, please. I think mine's perhaps nearly similar to what Andy just asked. You've, you've put the, quite clearly on the sheets of scenario one. I wondered how the, the number of scenarios there were that you've perhaps looked at but perhaps uh, decided not to yeah. um, progress any further at the moment. No, um, so we had a range of scenarios. I think the ones that... Um, we put forward in the medium term financial strategy. So this one actually has sort of become a, a blended live scenario because scenario one was um, council tax at 1.99% and that produced the, the budget gap of 13.1 million. Um, we, I think we did also model on a scenario two which had a um, social care precept of 2% and that took the gap down by roughly 2 million. And then we had a scenario three that had the social care precept of 2% and the business rates 
um, retention pilot continuing for next year. So following the spending review, I'd say we're actually closer to scenario three, really. We're kind of a, a two points, one sort of, you know, in between the two, two and three. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor McPhee. Uh, I was just um, checking there, but somewhere it says that you're going to cut back the capital expenditure. Um, um, what, what's, what's the procedure in terms of will the Cabinet see that and discuss it? Will we see it and discuss it? Will yep. we get a chance uh, to uh, yeah. comment? Yeah. Um, in terms of, the, there's no plans to um, cut back any existing capital program items. Um, the only changes to capital will be profiling on delivery. So when the money gets spent, that's used so we can calculate um, our borrowing requirement in terms of borrowing needed for 100% council funded capital. Um, so that's used for basically our um, revenue repayment of capital borrowing, but there's no plans to cut back any capital program items. So the cuts that are coming, then are not going to be the capital items, they're going to be the budget expenditure. Yeah, yeah. I've already seen some things that I wanted to, to happen going back into the next year. So, yeah, so we're not doing major reprofiling on capital. There will be just a general update to delivery timetables that's you know, linked to the existing program and where things are with procurement and um, you know, sourcing contractors and managing things through current capacity within the workforce. Councillor Hughes, did you have a question? No. No, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> okay. Councillor Duguid. So, just to clarify, <clears throat> Andy, what you've just presented there is purely revenue. Yeah. So, the, the capital isn't, isn't being affected. Now, I mean, in the, just be patient with me for, for a little bit. In the private sector, normally the revenue would have effect what you can, would have an effect on what you can spend on capital because it would be free cash flow effectively. But that doesn't work because in in, in Baines or a unitary authority because you get your capital through different allocations and grants essentially. Is that right as a premise? Well, it, yes and no. A large part of the capital program is grant funded on major infrastructure schemes. However, we've got a large number of elements of the capital program that's corporately funded. So where we take out borrowing to um, fund that capital and we fund that through revenue. So say you take out a, um, you know, a, cap a scheme where it's got a 50 year life, we'll take out the, um, the loan if we need to cash flow it through a, a loan and then there'll be the interest rate factored into that that's apportioned over 50 years. So we have the principal repayment plus interest we'll have to fund that um, through revenue. So that's the financing of that capital investment. Right. But that's, but that's all, in a way, it's um, built into our core budget assumptions that we roll on um, a regular basis. So we've got annually around, um, I think it's around a million added to our revenue requirement for capital investment. Okay. Lots of the schemes go multi-year, so a lot of that's been allocated. And is the profile of that capital, is more of it coming through WECA rather than central government? Are you seeing that as a trend or isn't it as clear cut as that? I'd, I'd say more through WECA um, on some of the um, larger schemes, but it's, it's mixed. Right. You know, there's more DFT money that's now um, been allocated via WECA and more will be allocated via WECA through the um, City Region Sustainable Transport. Okay. I'm still a bit confused about reserves. Could you just remind us what we've taken out of reserves this current year and how that marries up with what you're saying for next year at the moment and where that will lead us? I tend to, if my recollection's right, when the current administration started, there was roughly about 40 million of reserves, of which 30 were um, uh, specific reserves and 10 were general reserves. It was round about yeah, that quantum, wasn't it? Oh, right, I do remember. Yeah, and there's probably around, yeah. probably around the, the 50 million mark and around um, 13 are an earmark general, yeah. and the balance is specific service reserves or there's um, commitments held against them. And where are we now at this point in time? We're, we're broadly the same. So um, we have utilised um, reserves to 
manage the 21-22 um, um, budget. However, in 2021, through the um, COVID recovery plans, the council managed to mitigate a lot of its financial exposure risk, so it didn't have to draw on the, um, the financial planning reserves that were earmarked to um, get ourselves through the first year of the pandemic in terms of 2021. So we've kind of held the level at the same position um, for the start of this financial year. However, we have built in, um, to answer your direct question, what reserves did we allocate into the budget? It was around um, 7 million financial planning reserves in this financial year and a further 3 million into 22-23. And that was in recognition that our income um, exposure was around um, 15 million. So that was helping manage that transition period. And then we've got the repayment of those reserves in the later years of the um, financial plan. Right. Um, so despite having to dip into the reserves, we're, we're still roughly at the same level of reserves that were in 2019. Well, no, when, when we closed off the 2021 financial year, we're in right. the same level, so we didn't have to go into the reserves okay. to earmark to manage the COVID impact because of the, largely down to the, um, the package from government in terms of sales fees and charges, but also um, our own financial recovery measures helped um, bring the council into a balanced budget position. Yep. So we didn't overspend. If we had overspent, say, 10 million, we'd have had to go into reserves by 10 million. That was the risk that was set out in the COVID recovery plan in 2022, uh, 2021. Okay. And then the saving proposals that you put up there is 12.3 million. Yeah. Um, that will have to be a combination, presumably, of cuts and postponements in, in, in general terms, or what? Um, it's, it's a combination of um, and productivity yeah, gains. Of things. So there's not not everything has to be cut when it comes to savings. There's um, different proposals for service delivery um, options around areas within social care that um, can generate savings through different um, types of care placements, different um, locations for care. So it comes in more affordable than high cost. So that's an example where you can um, you know create a um, more affordable offer through looking at a revised way of delivering the service. Um, there will be areas where there's lower levels of spending, but there's also areas where we've got income generation also. Final question, Chair, just on energy. Do, do we have a hedge as a council, or would, is, is that appropriate, is it hedging um, in the future? I um, don't think we're allowed to, we're not allowed to take out financial instruments okay. today for hedging. All right, and just then a final question on borrowing. You're, you're not looking at further borrowings for next year. Obviously, you can't borrow for revenue, yeah. but um, is borrowing roughly on your assumptions at the moment staying static? Um, we'll be refreshing one of our borrowing requirements based on the capital program profile, um, but it's, it is staying relatively static in terms of our cash flow projections. Um, we're not anticipating significant borrowing, but it is really down to the, the delivery program of the, of the capital. So um, if um, a few of the more significant schemes get into their main delivery phase, we'll be taking out more borrowing, but it's within our limits. It'll be definitely within our um, capital finance and requirement limits. And the interest rate that the public sector works boards charging at the moment, what, what sort of level is that? Um, been creeping up towards 2%. Right. So it's been below 2%. Thank you, Chair. Great. Does anybody else have any questions? Right. So um, we've just been asked to um, note and discuss the update to the median term financial strategy budget assumptions. I think we've probably done that then, Andy. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Thank you. Um, may we now move on to item number 10, which is the economic development. Can I just say? Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm struggling to hear back here. Is, 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 could we turn the volume up a little tiny bit on the microphones? Are we able to turn possible? the volume up? We've got some slides here, and we've obviously had your report. Thank you very much for that. 
So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Simon Martin. I'm the Director for Regeneration Housing and Economic mm -hmm. Development and Skills comes under my portfolio director area. Um, Claire Lynch is the Manager for um, Skills and Business Support. Um, and we've come along today to give you an update on the service and the work, um, more generally around the scope of the service um, and what we've been working on to respond to the questions you've raised. Hi, thanks. Over to you. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for your time. Um, so to start off, I thought it was quite appropriate to give a brief outline as to the team that obviously report into us and deliver the critical service that we've been offering, certainly over the last 18 months. Um, and also to highlight that there may be 14 within the team, but actually only four of them are full-time as well. Um, so we've got two principal officers, Anna Garner, she is responsible for inward investment, um, supporting our properties with growth um, and innovation. Rob Dawson, some of you may know, um, he's responsible for the, um, he predominantly works on um, economic intelligence data for us, but also uh, looks after our UBS, uh, Universal Business Support Programme, um, as well as our Invest in Bath, which we are now turning to Invest in Baines, which I can go into later. Um, we have B Simmings, she is um, our policy and planning officer, so she supports those departments, um, but she's also the lead for our economic development strategy. Um, Will is employment and skills officer, um, again I can go into more detail about some of the projects that he's leading on um, in a bit. Laura Knight is our employment officer um, and she is the lead for our section 106 TR&T but also for the um, setting up of the Kickstart Gateway. Um, we have Mark Rogers, who's our business engagement officer, so he's out there talking about the services that we offer within the Baines region. Um, Saucy and Sandy are engagement officers for the Employment and Skills Pod, which is actually a contract that we won, won through Flexible Support Fund, which Will is leading on. Um, and again, I can go into more detail about that one later and Future Bright, which is a WECA contract, um, which is led by Claire Middlehurst, and she has four coaches that report into her and an administrator. So the business and skills team, um, our core function is to deliver sustainable inclusive growth, which enables residents and businesses to meet their full economic potential in our district. We share specific information about targeted business support, financial assistance and skills support programs. We're currently coordinating and producing an economic strategy, and from that will come the employment and skills plan. We're also the main point of contact for coordinating support services to local businesses and residents, and we run two platforms, which is Invest in Baines now, um, and also Achieve in Baines. And as I mentioned earlier, we've also got the inward investment side, um, which supports business retention, offering tailored services to support businesses wishing to relocate and expand. Um, and we work in partnership with IBB, which is the Invest Bristol and Bath WECA department. Um, and also we sit on the panel for the Bath Unlimited. So in with investment and retention, so for North East Somerset, there has been over the pandemic, especially a steady stream of smaller and startup retail. So the local high streets seem to have been quite resilient. We have a number of inquiries that are coming through at the moment for smaller industrial in Midsummer Norton and the wider Summer Valley area. Wilmots um, are moving to the old Dickies building. With that, they're bringing between 50 to 80 jobs into the region, um, and they're also bringing a training centre which will specialise in HGV driving. Um, Bridges supported with the plan, we've currently supported them with the planning application to Westfield um, Industrial Estate. Uh, there's a number of planning applications for industrial units in Clutton, and there are slowly some more agricultural inquiries for land, such as small holding and farm-based wellness and mental health projects, and one of which we've recently supported. Um, in Bath, um, when the pandemic hit after a couple of months, um, two of our main US invested companies closed their offices. Um, which was Wild and Wolf and Funko. Between them, we lost about 180 jobs in the region. Um, we were able to take our Future Bright team into those offices to support with redundancies and also signposting onto other services. Um, the take up through 2020, as to be expected, really, um, the office uh, industry was quite resilient um, during the lockdown, um, but currently the office vacancy rate 
are higher and the lease signings are down so far this year. Um, but we have good protection for offices due to the World Heritage Site exemption. So the landscape today, um, we are renowned as being a very prosperous region. Uh, we do have two amazing universities and our Bath College campuses, um, but we do have a number of underlying skills and employment issues. Bain suffers what's called from an hourglass economy. Um, this is the highly skilled and the highly paid versus those that are on a lower pay with very little progression routes. Uh, the high level of employment, um, we were in that, it was in the appendix one, I'm not sure if you saw, but is predominantly in financial, banking, legal, education, but equally the high level of employment, um, but there's low pay in the care sector, um, hospitality and accommodation. So the economic strategy, um, we're looking at renewing this. The last one, I believe, was written in 2014. Um, B, as I mentioned, is the lead for this. <laughs> um, so um, the approach that we're taking is that it will be a data-led strategy. Um, we've currently just appointed some consultants that will do a deep dive into the data for us. Um, so the approach that we'll take will address key issues which have been identified by the One Share Vision, the Local Industrial Strategy and the West of England Recovery Plan in order to align with future funding streams. We'll draw on the ambition of the One Shared Vision and the Zero Carbon Approach, committing to strong and sustainable growth across the authority area. We've had a very clear steer from the beginning that it needs to be a partnership approach to deliver governance and ownership, drawing in the community and key anchor institutes. Um, and our aim is for it to be aspirational and visionary rather than just an action plan. And the spatial element sets out the strategic case for different economic interventions. So this will feed into our planning and regen departments for the local new blah, the new local plan and the economic recovery and implementation plans. We do know that obviously there will be some really challenging questions that come from this. Um, it will get us to look at the shape of our economy, the data inclusion and infrastructure, the aging population the critical low levels of industri industrial stock, blah, sustainability and zero carbon approach, and also to be addressed in the economic recovery and implementation plans will be those pockets of severe deprivation and inequalities across a range of indicators and the spatial disparities. I will not go through all of them, but basically these are essentially what we as a team um, look as our key priorities. So whenever we are working in partnership or looking at new projects, these will be some of the indicators that we look for. Um, certainly from a skills perspective, we have been really focusing on digital inclusion um, and skills to be able to upskill and retrain um, staff and those that are unemployed. We are working really closely with ECA, uh, WECA to get up-to-date LMI information that we can then pass out to the school so they can use for career development. Um, also working and addressing inequalities and disabilities with um, the local businesses. Again, I'll forward these out so you can have a look at them if you want. This is a list of some of the skills projects that we are currently leading on or have awarded money to providers in the area to deliver on our behalf. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, Laura is the lead for our Kickstart program, so we are a gateway for Baines. We have, in, we have initially spoken with 63 businesses, um, currently have 27 individuals, young people out on placements at the moment, and Baines Council are one of those. Um, we, as I've mentioned earlier, the Employment and Skills Pod, we were one of the first departments to get flexible support fund. Um, through DWP to allow us to set up an employment skills pod supporting those who are long-term unemployed um, out at Peasdown in the hub. So we integrate with anybody who's looking at reskilling, um, retraining, looking at new job opportunities. Um, and then we've got that running until the end of September. Um, we've just set up a 3D academy working with Bath College and Hobbs 3D. Um, this is working, again, funding through the DfE, um, which supports anyone who's 18 plus with 3D printing, VR and AR, and predominantly on those that are unemployed to help them reskill and look at different sectors. Um, and we had a big focus on hospitality and retail as well. Um, 
We thought it was appropriate to put some information about our working relationship with Weka. Um, we work incredibly closely with them and at an officer level have a great relationship with them. Um, on a weekly basis, I have an EDM meeting with the other local authorities, um, which is chaired by Ant Merritt, who's the head of um, enterprise and innovation. I also regularly attend the skills officer groups, which are held on a monthly basis. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to talk about any new grants that are coming up, any difficulties that we have in our area, and to kind of get a bigger, better scope of the landscape. Um, we also worked really closely with um, with IBB, um, getting the Netflix event, which was held here last month. I'm not sure if any of you attended. Um, and we also supported heavily with the Skills Summit that happened recently this year. Um, as I've mentioned, we have been promoting and working really closely with all the grants that have come through this year, and there was a good sign-up um, within North East Somerset and Bath businesses. Um, and we've also, it's not been made public knowledge as such yet, but um, there was the Government UK Community Renewal Fund, which was led by Wecker, and Baines was successful with one of those grants, and that's supporting charities and social enterprise businesses. Please, please yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so these are some of our successes um, and projects that we have currently got running at the moment. I won't go through all of them, but again, if there's any that you want to go through, then please let me know. Um, there was information in the appendix about Future Bright and UBS. Um, so the TRT Section 106, um, we currently are speaking very closely with our planning and procurement about the implementation because we've been running this for a long time. However, Due to the pandemic, we weren't able to get students out on placement. Um, I think there was a total of 20, but we really want to narrow this down and we really want to kind of get it good because it's a good source for us to be able to use for work experience. Um, we've got 80 students lined up to start in January. Um, over the last 18 months, the team have been working relentlessly supporting individual businesses with the grants. Um, and we've worked out, I think it's about 4,500 businesses in total that we've supported. We're currently in the process of um, doing an aftercare service as well to speak to all of those businesses and others to see how we can help them progress and move forward. Um, Women's Work Lab, this was another flexible support fund that we were successful with. Uh, they've been delivering three cohorts in Baines, specifically supporting lone parents, returners to work and survivors of domestic abuse. Um, we are on our final cohort, um, so the funding runs out at the end of January, um, but essentially we've had full, a full cohort each, each time, um, and all of them have gone on to a work placement. From the first cohort, we had 17 attend, um, 13 complete, and 9 go into work, which has been a real success. Um, and probably the schools board I've mentioned about in the 3D Academy. The CEIAG, we managed to get about 20 grounds, I think it was, from Weka, um, of which we worked with the three special schools within Baines. And from that, what we have done is offer them careers advice specifically for the students and also for the parents. Uh, we're working with the college on a Green Skills Academy. We've just started up a Care Academy with Bath College and the Skills for Care. We are working very closely with key cities and we'll be hosting an event in January with them. Um, and I've just set up a skills board with both universities and Bath College. And this is for us to work together to be able to bring more funding into the area. And that's it. Great, thanks very much. Um, right, open to the panel. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Right, so I saw uh, Councillor Singleton, then Councillor Hughes, and then Councillor McFill. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much indeed for that presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions and comments uh, based on the paper in the pack rather than that, because it would be really useful to get that presentation if we could please afterwards. Um, and, and, and firstly, a sort of a comment just in some awe of what the team achieved during COVID, particularly the COVID support grants. I think it's a fantastic success and, and, and well done to everybody. Um, a couple of questions on Appendix 1. Uh, firstly, in the, the SWOT analysis under opportunities, it talks about a current chronic lack of supply of A-grade office space. 
And that seems to be in some little bit of dissonance about what was being said about office space here. Therefore, presumably, it's about A-grade office space we're talking. Is there evidence that there is unmet demand for a grade office space, or is this a, a hope for the future? That, that, that's one question. A second one is on page 33, when you're talking about the potential economic impacts of the green recovery, and specifically the GVA impact and the employment impact. Um, I'd love to get a little bit under those figures and work out where they come from. I mean, how much uh, how sure we can be of those sorts of benefits, or whether, again, we're very much in sort of forecast mode, but how, how well based forecast mode. Can I, thank you. Thanks. I'll take the first question in terms of um, office uptake and interest. Um, and it is, to a degree, a disparity between the quality of office stock traditionally that's been available in Bath and North East Somerset compared to business needs for modern office, mo modern, flexible, higher quality, more sustainable space. I think what's been really fascinating and um, the old economic strategy was very clear and the evidence was very strong around um, demand for modern grade A office space on flexible larger floor plates, which has always traditionally been very hard to deliver in Bath. Um, in particular, but it equally flows out to Cainsham with things like the Summerdale development and the uptake in offices down in Summerdale and to a degree flows out into some of the um, Soma Valley Midsummer and Autumn business space as well. It's been really fascinating to see what COVID and the post-pandemic post demand will be. Um, clearly the council have developed some of that office op stock um, through Bath Keys. We currently hold and sit on 55,000 square feet of um, speculative office that we developed. We have um, strong demand in the market for that space and the evidence is that there is still an undersupply of modern space and there is still a strong market interest in Bath and in, in North East Somerset in particular um, for relocation. Um, so the, the demand exists. The challenge is that a lot of businesses are struggling to um, decision make quickly with so much change going on with the pandemic. So um, there is strong interest. We are securing interest where we have a, a, a kind of a pipeline that far exceeds the quantum of space that exists in Bath at the moment. Um, there are three buildings going through refurbishment at the moment back into office stock in the city centre. Um, so there's confidence that, that there is market demand. The challenge is the timetable over which businesses will be able to make decisions. Um, although we don't think anything has changed from a business need perspective, that the direction of travel needs to be much more flexibility in the types of premises businesses occupy um, and the likelihood that, that whilst business, um, the volume of space that each individual business might go down, the, the need to still maintain an office presence and an office based for future kind of um, employment growth, future staffing is very strong. Um, so the evidence is very compelling that the market is still in demand of that space. I think I might leave Claire to answer the particular yeah. point um, on the, the the data and evidence point in the in the economic strategy paper. Yeah, which I'm. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll take it down and get Rob, who worked on this piece, to come back to you, if that's possible. Yep, thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Hughes, you had a question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've got a couple of questions, one to do with the, um, the presentation and one to do with the report pack. So with the presentation, there's a huge amount of names and acronyms of projects and programs and such like. But and the, the, as a business owner in the area, I've run a couple of businesses in Bath and North East Somerset. I'm not aware of any of those, and there's a couple I'm aware of through being a counsellor. Yeah. But how are we communicating this with businesses in Bath and North East Somerset? Because, um, you know, Future Bright, Invest in Baines, businesses and skills teams, is there 
a detailed and easy to read document that can be circulated to councillors that they can circulate to businesses in their areas? Or, I mean, how are we, yeah. the one thing the council seems to be very poor at is communication. Um, we rely on press releases to be picked up by the press and circulated. So that's my question. How are we actually making businesses aware that all of these exist? Okay. And, Shall I answer that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we, yeah, so through the websites generally we do advertise a lot of that information. We've also recently started um, a number of different networks. So we have got um, an employer engagement network and we've just set up a steering group which invites employers on there to hear about some of the projects that we're working on um, and for us to start that level of communication. Um, so we are, we are aware that there is so much provision out there and we are trying to tackle that, but it's not something you can do overnight. And also actually engaging with some of the businesses. They don't often want to know unless there's something that we can help initially with to start that conversation. Um, so we are aware of it. We do send it out on the newsletters. Um, and again, if we need to do more with that, then I'm happy to take it away and look at it. OK, thank I you. I think if I could just add to that, because um, I think it is really interesting that um, uh, to ensure we get good communication out, we've, we, we've historically taken the approach that we use the Invest brand through the Invest in, what, what used to be the Invest in Bath website as an easy touch point for businesses in Bath and North East Somerset. Um, and as Claire mentioned, um, we're going through an exercise of looking at the branding of that because that was an easier to access portal for business than trying to hunt through the Bath and North East Somerset Council website to find those bits of information. Um, and I think it, we're probably not as good as we need to be communicating the Invest brand to businesses. And that's a piece of work Claire's been particularly focused on looking at how do we get the message to business? Because it does provide a one point of contact platform to enable businesses to access the complexity of all the WECA grants and the various grants that come through. Um, and and, and there are a huge plethora of kind of support grants available to business and it is quite difficult if you're a business to, to find which one fits you. And so we, we've historically taken the view that, that putting it all in one umbrella place in the Invest brand of Invest in Bath is quite a good way to act for businesses to access it. But I, I think our communication of that to businesses could could be improved and we, we could look to, as to how we can access more businesses through that yeah. brand. Also, just on that as well, if I might, um, we've also started working very closely with um, various networks such as the um, Initiative, which again, we've been working with them, but it's never really been a measured approach. But now we're reviewing that, so we'll work with them and say, right, well, we need to engage with a certain amount of businesses, we need them to know about this type of service. So we've really started looking at that and also for tech tech sparks and various other networks just to engage with those particular sectors as well. Uh, sorry, can I just jump in because that was one of my questions um, and I've written a list of, of possibly um, areas that you can go through, especially um, to, to North East Somerset businesses. Um, invest in Bath, yes, the problem is it's invest in Bath. It's not invest in Bath and North East Somerset. So some of the North East Somerset businesses just won't engage with that. Um, but we've got community hubs throughout, throughout the uh, region now. Um, some the libraries have now, some of the uh, community libraries have now morphed into community hubs. They're a great way of getting the message out. Um, obviously, the Chew Valley um, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Um, and then I wondered whether the um, forums, obviously, are probably a, a good good way to get into parish councils. A lot of the parish councillors run their own businesses, so that could trickle out as as well. So. Um, and obviously, you might want to just do a presentation in each of the core areas like Canesham, Chew Valley, um, Soma Valley, um, and um, obviously Bath. Oh, that's a very good suggestion. Um, I think we'll, we'll definitely take up on that. I think the brand point around the fact that it historically has been invested in Bath is acknowledged, and it's something we need to look to change to be more inclusive and more broad-reaching. 
We've also got um, high street hubs now. So as part of the Love High Streets program we've, um, and the investment in high streets, we've got identified high street hubs that are supporting traders in Cainch and Bath and Midsummer Norton at the moment. We are looking to extend that out to more centres, but um, those are really good touch points as well to, um, to ensure that we've got the sort of business and skills service represented in those locations. Thank you. Councillor Hughes for hijacking your question. <laughs> no Thank you. So my second question is to do with um, industrial space or more the, the, the erosion of industrial space in Bath and North East Somerset. Um, we can see from the numbers that manufacturing is, is far less significant than um, office space based employment and we seem to have quite an emphasis on this, uh, the digital economy. Um, but we can see from, from recent planning um, issues that the planning inspector doesn't seem to share our, our vision. Um, I mean, we've seen um, the, the, the issue with the Plum Centre now becoming student apartments. We've seen, um, we've seen that the industrial estates, uh, the one-site business centre, is now going to become a care home. Uh, we're losing industrial space on the lower Bristol roads, um, potentially the Regency um, dry cleaners is going to become accommodation. So what's our plan? Are, we, are, we, are you working with the planning department to try and develop some policy to try and protect or even enlarge our industrial space? We are, yeah. The um, ELSNO, which is the Employment Land um, Review supporting the spatial development strategy and new local plan is seeking to identify and safeguard industrial land within the district. Um, it is a perennial challenge and the, uh, certainly the economic development team spend a lot of time fighting for the industrial cause, which is to try and retain space. Um, I think it, there are, again, as part of the economic strategy, um, the, the appendix highlights to a degree the over-reliance in certain sectors which doesn't lend itself to a resilient industrial base for the district. I think one of the things we're, we're seeking to do through um, commissioning a new economic strategy is trying to identify and address the particular kind of strengths Baines could have to contribute to industrial um, employment and industrial um, space within the district because I don't think we compete necessarily very well particularly when it comes to logistics, the scale of space and size of industrial offer we have in the district. And we probably, we, we feel we need more evidence to be able to find a niche that continues to try and maintain a, a strong industrial base, because as you've identified, the proportion of our economy that is industrial is now diminishingly small, and it would be good to find a resilient and higher base for that in the district. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think we could we could show a stronger commitment to things like the the Soma Valley Industrial Zone, yeah. for example, which has been dragging its heels for quite some time now, um, and is several years away from any type of actually like a spade in the ground and actually start some actual development down there. So perhaps we could be pushing to actually start increasing our industrial areas yeah. with areas like that. And, there, and I think Claire highlighted with some of the things like. Um, uh, the Wilmot's relocation into Dickies, there is, there is demand. Mm -hmm. So there is demand for that space. The challenge is that in, in delivering that space, it's competing with higher value uses. So it is the point you raise about ensuring that we safeguard that space for industrial use, because otherwise it gets sort of, it gets eroded from higher value uses like care homes and residential and other uses that try and compete for it. Um, but the positive is there is demand for, for the industrial space, particularly within the Soma Valley. So I agree with you. We, we must accelerate things like Soma Valley Enterprise Zone. Okay. Thank you. All right. Councillor McPhee, please. Well, just to continue uh, that point, um, are you working with planning? Do you have meetings with planning? Uh, you know, are the projects to, to secure... Uh, those things? We do now, and I think if um, my director, Sophie Broadfield, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, um, would have highlighted that the council's reorganised so that we've now got a su sustainable communities directorate, 
which has brought all of the place services into one directorate within the council for the first time in probably, well, pro possibly ever, but certainly for the first time. So the planning service, both in a policy and a development management sense, strategic transport and sustainable and active travel, economic development, and the regeneration services are now all, all within one director's remit, which is enabling us to have a much more joined up conversation and working arrangement about as you say, working very closely with planning colleagues to ensure that we get the right outcomes from development? Yeah. Well, uh, that brings me as well on to buses. And your hourglass uh, figure indicates that there's a lot of poorly paid people that are coming into Bath, and they're probably coming in early in the morning and leaving late at night. Being in Kensham, we can see our bus services being less frequent and, and stopping earlier, both to Bristol and to Bath. And again, you know, Baines has lost access to, or control, if you like, of the buses. So what can you do? Uh, because that's a crucial element in economic development. It is. It's, it? it's probably a question, probably for a different scrutiny, but we have been successful in, um, and Andy mentioned it in his budget summary, around the capital investment for the um, uh, city regional um, sustainable transport funding. So um, WECA have received is it 540 million, Andy, um, through settlement for investment in public transport principally over the next five year period. A significant element of that comes through to Bath and North East Somerset, particularly for corridor improvements for the A4 corridor, the A37 corridor, and the A367 sort of corridor to improve bus services to connectivity, um, particularly to address some of those points around the in commute, out commute for lower wage um, employment. But the other challenge it also relates to is good quality and affordable housing stock within the city because a large part of that commute is, is caused by the lack of available um, affordable housing within Bath itself. Yeah, uh, and we welcome the, uh, the uh, commitment to social housing and the social building, which we hope uh, will contribute to that. Um, so, uh, uh, and I'm not too worried from Canesham, you're right, we're sitting on the corridor, I'm more worried about uh, the Summer Valley uh, and the connections there. Um, uh, going to your report, um, as a statistician, um, the, the records and what you do with the self-employed, I mean, you almost give up and say, well, we can't, we don't know how many of them are in these other numbers. Uh, is there some, something you can do to give us a bit more information about the self-employed? Again, what I can do is, because Rob's obviously heavily involved in that side of the, the, the stats, essentially. So if you want, I can ask and yeah. get that back to you. Yeah. Um, now, I was very pleased in your uh, uh, presentation to see a good big chunk on Bath and uh, on North East Somerset. So that was... Uh, it was very, very welcome. But you must realise that I still have the basic point that you probably spend too much of your time in Bath and not enough in North East Somerset. Um, it, uh, so therefore, all I'm asking is that the indicators or the data uh, of, of effort um, you know, are available so that when people say that to me on the door, which they do a lot, all the money goes to Bath, I can give them some, some, some numbers. I mean, I've already told them about invest in Baines, and, and that's a very good, uh, a very good one. So I, I, I welcome it, but we need more. Okay, I'm on it. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Furs and then Councillor Holt. Thank you. I've got three points, Chair. Uh, first one, following on from what uh, the other said about, one of the challenges we've always had is Radstock, Midsummer Norton area, just following on from what, you, what you've been saying. 
for, for many, many years. And then the housing numbers come forward, the government housing numbers come forward, and we as Baines say, well, this is the place we'd like to economically generate, not just business-wise, but also housing, regeneration, all that. And it gets turned down. So there seems to be a sort of um, a difference of opinion as to this is the area of North East Somerset. And the stats tell us that these are low-paid jobs in the area, as a lot of them were commuting, that's sort of outward commuting from Radstock, Midsummer Norton, and also there is all the um, unemployment and low skills in that, that sort of general area. So it needs a lot of effort. And it needs, you know, like you're saying about the transport corridors and the Summer Valley Industrial Zone, you know. More effort, I think, needs to be placed on that because that will generate, regenerate the whole of Bath and North East Somerset and give those skills and jobs across the board. So that's the point I'd like to make there, Chair. Second one was, um, second one was about the, I'm pleased in your report that you picked out the areas of deprivation, um, although there are pockets of deprivation within the whole of Bath, not just in those sort of bluish areas that you showed on your map. But, and I was also pleased that you picked up on the NEETS issue. But the challenge again, surely, is about how we engage with those hard to reach people because they're difficult to engage with. And it really is a, a struggle. I know your kickstart programs and some of the things on your thing that were you know, encouraging, but I'd just like to sort of get a feel for how, how we're engaging, not with those, just those young people that I know of in, in Bath, but out in North East Somerset as well in the Radstock area, yeah. especially how we're getting them to first see that the FE College um, uh, as an opportunity for them, and that there are lots of job opportunities in the in the sub region. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's point number two, Chair. And point number three, talking about the sub region, this fits into the wider Wecker region. And I know in your report that you only sort of touch on Wecker once or twice. And somehow, I, when you hear Wecker talk, or when you hear um, about talk, any talk about the, sub, you know, the whole West of England region. We talk about skills and technology. We talk, you know, the, the Mayor of Bristol talks about technology and aerospace, but that's all in South Gloucestershire where everyone has to keep reminding him. Actually, that's in South Gloucestershire and not in Bristol. Yeah? But the, the region does rely on lots of spin-offs from that technology area. And I noticed on your slides that you mentioned legal, financial, etc., but not technology. And there are a number of companies within Bath that I know of, and one I work for, that deals with very high technology um, uh, software and, and that sort of um, uh, engineering skill, which probably should flag up because this is an area that, I know Simon knows it, but um, it's an area that there are lots of opportunity and there's a lot of jobs to be had and there are jobs hard to fill and there are lots of vacancies. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, so... Then it comes back to the affording how the, the affordability of housing. How do we attract these younger people, either from the universities to stay or into the region, um, to live here? And if they are living here, they're living out in Radstock. And then we've got all the traffic problems of the buses and all that. So all this sort of fits together. And if we're going to upskill and make sure that we get a better environment for all our residents, it's got to be done in the whole. So I think, I, I think I've covered all of that, Chair. And uh, if you can solve that, we're, we're, we're sorted, aren't we? Sorry, can I just add to your first point? Could you include True Valley in that? Because it is slightly different, because it's very agricultural. Um, but we have missed out on some um, great technology mm. companies because no rural broadband. Yeah. yeah. Mm. OK. Well, with, with regards to the skills element, um, all of the projects that we deliver are, are able to be done on an outreach basis, which is exactly why we ended up going for the type of funding that we did. So the Women's Work Lab, for instance, has been based at Odd Down, and it's been located there, and we've reached out to women, essentially not from the centre of Bath, but from those areas of deprivation for exactly that reason. Um, also, the Employment and Skills Pod, which is Flexible Support Fund, again, that is on an outreach basis, so it's based at Pease Down, but now we're locating once a week at the Wonsdike site, so we're out there integrating and wanting to go out and speak to residents and see how they can support. Um, and certainly with NEETS, I mean, we work incredibly closely with Youth Connect, who support all of our NEETS essentially for the area. We identified as soon as the pandemic hit that there was going to be a lot of issues with regards to those young people that don't have that support at home, that aren't able to have someone help them with an application. So we ended up writing a project plan which has been approved, I mean, unfortunately quite late down the line, but that was out of our control really. 
but now we've got an extension onto another project which can, can specifically support those individuals and go into schools and identify how they can be supported if they don't get that support at home. Um, and that's through, essentially, they've been identified through those being on the, who get the school meals, essentially. Um, but also, we supported and managed to get a small amount of money through from Weka um, to support a mental health project specifically for NEETS. Um, and again, that was done out at Vincent and Alton um, so that they could start interacting with other young people again because they've been so disengaged due to the pandemic. So, so that work is done, but maybe we need to shout about it an awful lot louder than what we are doing. We're fitting how, yeah, this, you know, these, this is a, it's all a strategy in its own right. Yeah. How does this fit into the wider West of England Mecca ambitions and viewpoint? Because there has to be a join up somewhere about how these skills, you know, cross, you know, because yeah. we all live in the same sub region, don't we? So, yeah. we, you know, boundaries when you're looking for a job, it doesn't matter whether that job's in South Gloucestershire or in Chew Valley or, or you're travelling from the Chew Valley to South Gloucestershire, that's a challenge, you know, and that's. That's what we. That's what our younger people are, are struggling with. I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Councillor Hodge. Thank you very much. It's only a small point. Going back to planning, actually, just to say whether the. Um, does it? Would it work? Did, I think, as another member of the planning committee, we we get such little, such a shortage of information, really, on the industrial. Um, case for a site and we, we all the time we're getting sites that earmark for in, industrial use and then an application comes through for something totally different and I just wondered if um, your team can um, be be regarded as more of cons consultees and add information to the officer's report I mean there's lots of different consultees in there and I think we could do with that information on the committee more detail rather than generally saying well that's a shame we've lost that industrial space I mean that's literally the level at which we can discuss it and if we if um, we can have more information coming through the officers come to you and, and you actually uh, contribute to the report I think that would be quite helpful yeah Thanks. Um, yeah, a few questions, a few observations. Simon, what, why hasn't this been really looked at since 2014? Is that a lack of... Well, it, it, uh, you tell me. 2015, it was 2015, it was updated, um, refreshed as part of the placemaking plan. Right. So when we went through the policy making um, for the updated local plan, refreshed local plan in 2015, it was updated then. Um, and it because it was till 2020, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a five-year um, economic strategy, 15 to 20. Right. So we, 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 we had commenced this process just at the start of the pandemic, when the pandemic struck, and then we've spent um, pretty much the first year and a half of the pandemic supporting businesses through the crisis with business support grant and the, the whole business support programme. Um, and also the programme for the new local plan slipped back a little bit as well. So we, we think, uh, hindsight's a great thing. Um, probably if we had started it pre-pandemic, whatever the outcomes of the strategy would probably be very, found very different yeah. than what we need now. Um, so it, it, it kind of probably now is the right time to re rethink the whole strategy. And just, just to back up and uh, Councillor First's point, presumably you fed into this. Yes. So the, the West of England local industrial strategy, I don't think it was just a top down, it was a, I wouldn't call the unitary authority a bottom up, but it was a two way process, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Although it's, um, it, it, has, it has to be said the regional strategy is quite formulaic as a, as a, um, a statutory instrument, as a sort of an evidence base for a statutory instrument. And it doesn't necessarily depict some of the nuances that you've raised today about particular shape and desire for our bit of the economy that fits within it. Yeah. So I think that, you know, and which is why we think, it, and it's how the two dovetail together, why it's so important to have a local economic strategy for Bath and North East Somerset that demonstrates how the rural economy supports the city economy and how we, because we're a very diverse part of the West of England, how the particular measures for things like industrial need to be um, evidenced and cross-referenced within Bath and North East Somerset. So you're happy that we're uh, getting across from a Baines perspective where we need to be in the west of England? Not, uh, 
Not fully, no, because the West of England strategy would suggest that you intensify the industrial uses in Avon Mount and some of the um, more significant accessible parts of the region um, and see a slight reduction in our region. And we don't necessarily believe, based on what we need to do for our economy, that locally that would be the best outcome for us. So there are certain evidence statistics in the regional rails report that we're challenging and working on, I would, I would say, Winston. OK, well, let uh, Councillor McPhee and I know how we can help you with the WECA dimension. Um, the other thing is, if there are benefits of COVID, and there are a few, one of the advantages would be that you presumably have got a much better database now of micros and SMEs because they've been applying for grants and therefore you've probably established relationships with people directly that you were having to go through wholesalers like the Chamber or the Small Business Federation or the Growth Hub. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the case. We supported four and a half thousand businesses through the pandemic, Bath and North East Somerset businesses of about 8,000 total businesses in the district. So over half of them we have direct contact with now. Um, we've also got statistics that through the invest in Bath sort of vehicle, we regularly update over 3,000 businesses on a regular contact basis as well. So we do have a much, um, a much more developed and um, uh, relationship with a much wider range of businesses in Bath. And okay, because that, that's really key and goes back to Councillor Hughes. I, I'm with him. Say that, 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 that a lot of this is awareness, yeah. Yeah. and I think you know that was a really great presentation. It it, it backed up what you did in the document because just seeing the document asked a lot of questions, uh, that, and we were struggling along thinking, well, uh, hang on, this is base camp one. Where are they going? When are they going to get to base camp two, etc. But there's a lot of data and there's a lot of goodies you're doing there, yeah. which is actually making quite a big impact. Yeah. So um, I think it's using leveraging that relationship. Probably in your departments, having someone who's a bit more, if you haven't got it already, dedicated to that relationship management yeah. or communication relationship management. And I think that, that's good. You didn't mention the Growth Hub in your presentation, did you? Uh, and what's the relationship there? I, I, I didn't pick it up. If I did, I'm sorry, I was half asleep. No, I, you're right, actually. And I think that's just more staring and not necessarily interesting. But yeah, we have a really good relationship with the Growth Hub. Because WECA's putting a lot of, if you listen to the WECA side of it, they're trying to uh, push everyone to the Growth Hub for a lot of where they can get advice from in terms of yeah. financing small businesses in particular, whether it be loans, senior debt or equity. Certainly the Growth Hub is where they're being pushed there. Presumably a lot of training facilities as well, the push into the Growth Hub. But is that, yeah. I mean, that's what WECA is saying. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, absolutely. And we share a CRM. So as soon as they're referred through and they've been spoken to with the Growth Hub, we'll get notified through our system, through a CRM that we share. Okay. So... Uh, one other thing I think uh, Councillor McPhee and I have read in other papers is that I believe Bristol have got an Invest in Bristol office still in Brussels. And one of the challenges is whether that could be e elongated out to Wecker. I just, uh, you know, uh, I think that may be something that need to be, may need to be just make you aware that it's something certainly on my agenda. If there is a Bristol office in Invest in Bristol, still out in Brussels, for instance, then maybe it might be sensible to make that a Wecker office and that we might, you know, in Baines get part of the case. It's just a, a small point, but there are folks, so with what's happened, you know, I'm not making a political statement, we need to have that, that conduit um, for, for, for future investment. Um, I, th I think what, what I wanted to go, but by the way, Andy, perhaps you can answer this. Who does Planning report into? Which senior member, of the, which member of the senior leadership team? Because so I'm looking at the um, structure, who? It does report into yeah. it. Right. So, so did you get that answer? That, so it reports into Sophie planning. So it, it should be joined up in that respect. It should be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, yeah, and it's a new structure. So you know, yeah. so, Sophie so came into post in all, August. <laughs> We've organised. Sophie's organised the team now. So, um, and there are a number of key vacancies and key kind of resourcing requirements across the team. So our. Uh, um, lead on climate emergency, for example, and our lead on sustainable and active travel are both, you know, we've got to formalise those in the structure because they're both vacant posts at the moment, but the head of planning, my role is sort of 
looking after the regeneration, economic development um, and housing aspects all report into SAFI together as a set of place services as part of the Sustainable Communities Directorate. Right. Okay, just going back to the list of questions we, we forwarded you, um, I mean, what, time scales, because you, you made the case we need to do a, 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 you've got a lot of the information there. When are you going to be comfortable that you've got a new plan? And so the time scales on that. And secondly, you know, we've been talking to some of your colleagues about KPIs and success criteria. So when's a plan going to be that you'll feel happy, right, we've got this new plan in place? And what are going to be the success criteria and the KPIs on that? And will you include a vision and a mission statement, for instance? Uh, the intention is yes. The plan, um, we're working to a timetable that broadly gets to a draft economic strategy um, for sort of engagement and consultation um, towards the first quarter of next financial year, so sort of June time. Um, we're already in commissioned on consultancy and, and moving forward with the evidence base and the data gathering. It all fits together behind the renewal vision piece of work that was prepared and undertaken as an overarching vision for Bath and North East Somerset, which, yeah. um, and, and so the sort of vision and mission statement really will sit behind that around the economic strategy that supports the vision and objectives of the renewal vision. So. Okay, and the last question then from me is, um, we, I don't think we really talk much about tourism. So where commercial heritage and commercial estate reports into the uh, group finance, so the um, chief finance officer, doesn't it? So um, th th there's just the connection there, because one of the big issues for us is um, just how far we take tourism in a post-COVID world, in international and domestic, and um, how far we can take it. I mean, I think 2019, if I remember, we had 6.25 million visitors, and just over a million of those, 1.2 million were overnight stairs. Obviously, it's dropped off the cliff, the international uh, travel, but it would be interested as part of that plan, linking in with the other side, to know well, where does it top out tourism? Is it 8 million? Because we don't want to become another Dubrovnik. We don't want to become another Venice. Uh, well, there is a, a finite level of what we want to do, and that fits in with hotel capacity and various other things, and the, and the growth at the moment of Airbnbs. Um, so will that be part of your plan, tourism, and where that sector fits into the overall economic plan? Certainly from, a, from the economic strategy point of view, certainly from the skills and employment aspect part of it and the upskilling part of it, it's front and central because our economy is very reliant upon that sector, particularly for employment, and it employs a lot of people, but at a fairly low wage level. So a big part of the skills plan is to understand how we increase the skills levels within that sector and make tourism jobs more valuable to both the economy and the, the people that do them. The other aspect, though, is, is in terms of our, our sector splits and the proportion of our economy, looking at the shape of the visitor economy in Bath and North East Somerset, what's been really interesting, again, post-pandemic, is shifting away from very transient short-stay dwells for lots of numbers of people visiting for a very short period of time to a much longer dwell time for people to come and stay for a longer duration with a very different tourism offer. So I think the economic strategy needs to talk to that around the broader offer of what's on offer in Bath and North East Somerset for a longer dwell time and a longer stay for tourism to change the profile of tourism. And that may not be about chasing numbers, it may actually be about chasing people's stay time and the offer we give them to diversify the offer so they don't come here for half a day and only go to the Roman baths, but they might come here for a week and visit the fashion museum and go out and enjoy the countryside and be, you know, do some active tourism. So the, our economic strategy needs to look at the sort of macro aspect of what proportion of our economy would, tour, would, it, would make a healthy economy for tourism to, to continue to contribute. But I think, again, Sophie and Andy, through sort of the, the heritage service plan, need to look at actually what's our service offer from a tourism point of view and how do we shift it from a, from a particular reliance on, on international short-stay tourism to perhaps more domestic long-stay tourism, for example. Good. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks, Chair.
Um, yeah, thanks for the report. I thought, I mean, the, 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 the appendix is headed case for a new economic strategy, and I think that we can't, no one would deny that that's necessary. <laughs> um, the climate emergency bit seems a little bit tacked on the end, and that may just be sort of the structure of the document. Um, I, I guess I would just make a case for the climate emergency being at the heart and the base of any new economic strategy and not an afterthought that's layered over the top. Um, that would be my major point. I'd also, um, it's kind of a, a, an extension of that is things like stay time for tourists and technology that Councillor Furs has mentioned, that all these things stem from that, but I, I uh, yeah, I would just implore that we, we make sure that that's at the base of everything and not, and not an afterthought. Councillor Hughes, I've got a couple of questions as well. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to, I just wanted to sort of mention a couple of concerns within my area, within the Soma Valley, um, relating to to employment, yep. um, which hopefully are going to be considered as part of your strategies going forward. One concern is the decision, the recent decision by the planning inspector to allow Mendip to build 500 homes on our border. We obviously have a lot of concern about the pressures that's going to put on local employment, both in the in Midsummer Norton area and, and of course Bath and the whole of Bath and North East Somerset. So that's a, that's a major concern locally. How are we going to manage this huge migration that potentially could happen? Um, the second issue that concerns us locally is the issue of, of housing. Um, house pricing in, in Bath has become very expensive and people on lower income careers or, or employment more and more are being forced to live in the, to, to, to move out of Bath. That in turn puts pressure on our housing stock, both for sale and the rental markets within Midsummer Norton. It also forces more people to move out of Bath and then commute back in to work, which again then, then goes on to this issue with the climate emergency where we're trying to reduce the amount of commuting and traffic coming into Bath. We're actually going to increase it. So there are two areas there that, um, that we have a lot of concern locally and I'm hoping there's some, some part of this strategy. I, could, I can only assume it's going to, be, it's going to have to be um, through some, some investments that you can uh, help tackle these issues. The transport investment, I think, is an acknowledged area that needs significant infrastructure investment. Again, you know, the exist e even with the existing road corridors, there needs to be significant investment in the public transport network, and that's sort of acknowledged, and even government acknowledged it through the CRSTS awards um, for improvements to public transport, and particularly bus services along the corridors. Um, it's, the, the housing challenge is an interesting one. I think you're absolutely right. You know, access to good quality, affordable housing at every location is as important as access to employment land and employment offer at every location. Um, and and if we don't address through a, a, a coherent housing strategy for Bath, some of the affordability challenges then you'll just push the problem out to make other areas less affordable and, the, and create even more reliance on in and out commuting. So I think, you know, I think we do need an active housing strategy to sit alongside the economic strategy and that's probably another work stream that needs developing around the council's response to, you know, through the policy setting around the housing trajectory and housing numbers. How do we actively ensure that that housing is affordable and purpose for local people, not just for an increasing population that, of, of inward migration to the district? Um, but I, and I acknowledge and take your point, particularly around the Soma Valley. Um, you know that those issues around um, things like the Mendip increases in housing supply. I, I suppose I look at it on the positive side. That you know, in a positive sense, that create that potentially creates more vitality for some of the district centres like Midsummer Norton and Radstock to be to, to provide, you know, good quality 
um, an increased activity within the high streets, for example, which will support local businesses and make them more resilient as local kind of district centres. Um, but it, at the same time, it probably needs to go along with continued support for skills and training that support our residents to be able to make the most of the opportunities and jobs that we can provide locally. Sure, but I mean, I think I think the point I'm trying to, absolutely, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that this, the overlap between you and the planning side of things is quite, I think is vital to making yeah, a strategy work. I mean, you, you, you spoke earlier about a grade office space is in demand, or perhaps we should be looking outside of Bath to build a grade office yeah. space so that there isn't this commuting um, issue. And perhaps we also, you also need to have some influence on the housing mix that we're building in Bath because the majority of the, the major constructions are one and two bed apartments, not family homes. So all of these issues go to, yeah. go to add, issue, add problems to this, uh, this issue of commuting. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good observation and I, I, I agree. I think it's a takeaway point that perhaps we'll, we'll feed back to Sophie um, and perhaps um, a future meeting we can come back and present more of a sustainable communities plan on on some of those place-based services and how they integrate with one another in future. And also just to reassure as well that B, who I mentioned earlier, who's leading on the economic strategy, is the one that sits in with policy and planning and does quite regular meetings and advising. So that, that connection is there. But again, I'll take your point. Great. Thank you. Um, so I had just a couple of observations. I was very pleased to see that um, you had on your list market gardens, because I think that is going to be fairly key out in some of the agricultural areas. Um, and again, it's sustainable um, and it's local uh, and it's usually seasonable, seasonal and it's usually organic as well. So you don't necessarily have to have grade one and two agricultural land. Um, and therefore there's that question mark and the balance about renewable energy going on to grade three agricultural land as, as an example. Um, the other point um, is, uh, and th this is something that I actually wrote before I got into the meeting, but I noticed that you had eight industrial units, um, you've been supporting somebody to get planning application for that. Now, I don't know where that is, I haven't seen the planning application, but as soon as I get home I will look at it. Um, but I just want um, there to be some balance that, you know, because of the nature of some of the areas in um, northeast uh, Somerset. Um, that was built on mining and in order to keep um, some of the uh, jobs and employment in the area, some areas have got industrial units on very, very small narrow lanes and we know that lorries are getting bigger and um, a number of our main, main um, roads um, in the area do tend to get blocked a bit. So I just um, ask that um, there's that balance between needing the industrial units and the offices, which is absolutely recognized, with um, uh, that balance of, you know, people have to be able to move and move around and I mean I've been stuck you know 10 minutes behind a lorry because it's gone down the wrong route or it's trying to get somewhere that it can't get so just just that um, just that balance really and I just wondered where we were also with rural broadband um, because clearly um, that has been um, that that's clearly been an issue with high-tech companies going into North East Somerset where there isn't very good um, broadband um, so I don't know whether you have connections with some of the sort of super fast broadband providers, um, but if you don't, I can put you in touch with those. We can, yeah, we can probably again bring back some information on the, the rollout for the connecting Devon and Somerset broadband rollout in the rural communities. So we're, we're part of the. CDS program that TrueSpeed are the contractor for rollout of Superfast across um, the rural districts, um, and there's a we can share a report on the uptake of that of, of the numbers, of particularly with residents and businesses who's who's taking up and how far their rollout program is going um, on on digital. 
Um, also, on, I think your, your point on was well made on the, the, the kind of accessibility issues of some of the industrial stock. Um, but also, I think there's a, you know, a, a good opportunity because a number of the sort of successful manufacturing businesses we have actually manufacture some very niche, very specialized and quite technically kind of um, uh, challenging kind of uh, components and parts. And it's not necessarily about mass distribution and wholesale kind of goods movement. So a number of and this is part of a parcel of kind of making sure we get the right mix of kind of economic activity and can provide the right sort of skills. But a number of the sort of employers down in the Soma Valley, for example, in different places, you know, there's not a lot of goods inflow and outflow. Actually, what they manufacture is some quite high quality, high grade components that, you know, in, in, in logistics terms are not huge bulk distribution and, and we should be focusing on the types of employers that can bring some really high quality jobs to the district but not necessarily huge bulk movement of goods and I yeah. think it's a good point yeah. to pick and up that, that, and that's good to hear yeah. so there are no more further questions we can um, we can uh, thank you very much um, and then move on to our our work plan okay um, so, um, moving to item 11. Sorry, I keep thinking this is my laptop and it's not. <laughs> okay. Yes, certainly. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got, um, for the 10th of January, we've obviously got the draft budget verbal update, but Andy, you'll give us as much... Um, written as you possibly can for that so we can digest it beforehand um, and start prepping for um, the 31st of Jan, um, which is clearly the council budget. And then you're going to um, bring us a, an update on the Community Contribution Fund progress report. And I guess you're going to tell us where that money might be going as well. I, I hope so because yeah, I yeah. think uh, yeah, just as an update, I think we've had about um, twenty five thousand pounds right. contributions okay. uh, to the window of applications. So I'm hoping by then that that process will have happened and we'll be able to review the approaches. Great. So thirty first of January is full budget, so it's the um, the Andy Wothery show. <laughs> and councillor, of course, councillor Samuel. Your name's your name names down there as as, as the lead and the report author. So, um, and then moving on to the twenty eighth of March, we have preparing for the future and the people strategy update. And I think councillor Hodge, you had something possibly to add that we'd like covered in the preparing for the future. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, Chair, thank you. I just wondered, was it along the way we've, um, you know, we've been following the strategy and we've raised um, requests for metrics on really the, the transport, um, you know, the, the information on transport and how, what the changes will be for people traveling to a new center and, and whether there really is going to be um, a climate emergency benefit for that and also um, impacts on recruitment and retention that uh, should be you know, becoming evident now from the changes in the way we're working. And also anecdotally concerned, you know, hearing more and more that um, employees that you know, have been issued with their laptops and they're not really seeing any prospect of getting back to an office space. And I, d I just wondered if we could add a, add a metric on that to um, give us a bit more information of where the all these departments are going to be working the ones that have lost their office space um, in Lewis House or the other floors of the Civic Centre and a bit more detail on what the plan is for them um, building on what we've been told so far. So may I suggest um, that we that I write representing this group asking for that information and the metrics and clarity around um, the um, officers being able to work. Is everybody happy with that approach? Yeah, thank you. And, and, and just to add, add to what you said there, Lucy, about re um, uh, recruitment and retention, that, you know, 
as ward councillors, we're probably all getting the same responses from officers going, can you get this? We haven't got the staff. We're, you know, there's something big going wrong somewhere, yeah? And I think that we should be um, yeah, prodding in the right places mm. and finding out what, what can be done to improve the situation. You know, yeah. It goes recycling, you know, waste collections, the whole, you know, basic, our basic, you know, front office to, you know, our, our front window, our shop window to the to the most of the public is simple things like waste collections and green bins and black bins and we, we can't, you know, the council's not delivering it. Yeah, and also, I don't know, um, I'm just wondering if there's any mitigation with, with officers being a bit overloaded as well, um, as I find that I don't always get a response and I don't know if other councillors are having a similar experience then um, and I think that might will we'll, um, put something to that effect in so if there's a policy change then we just need to know if there's a policy change that we have to go through the cabinet member but I don't think the cabinet member really wants to go into the minute detail of our planning applications uh, in our wards so okay y yes sorry could, could I just suggest on that that um, with new working practices and things, it might be a very good time to revisit the um, system under which officers and councillors work together and expected um, levels of service and things like that. Because I think that what currently exists and is published is probably now out of date. It's certainly not kept to. And I think we need an update. Thank you. I shall include that. Well, thank you, Councillor Singleton. So then we've got the people strategy update, um, and clearly, if um, officers are working from home, um, and also um, I know in the previous administration, I don't think there was an appraisal system across the board. So it'd be nice to get an update potentially on what sort of appraisal system there is now. That might have been a priority, and um, before I seem to recall that. Um, that was it. So again, I will ask. Uh, uh, yes, I will ask about some um, an update on the performance management system as well. And then we have the corporate um, risk register. Um, Mandy Bishop will be responsible for the report, and the director lead obviously is the chief executive. So um, we should get an update uh, on the risk register in March. We don't have anything for May at the moment. Does anybody, oh, there's, there was, there were two issues that we might, that we wanted to consider. One is decision making, and we had an example of decision making with the Christmas market. Um, so maybe we put that in for May. And I think that was, a, yeah, I was just going on to that then. So Mark, if we could pop um, decision making processes um, and then the, and the example is the Christmas market. Um, ADL, we would like to um, revisit ADL. We wanted some clarity around um, the remit of the corporate scrutiny panel. We believed that um, the business plan should come to the corporate scrutiny panel. So the accounts go obviously to the corporate audit um, committee and then I think the business plan should come here, but I just wanted some clarity around that, please. Um, and if that could come to us in May, is that all right, Winston? So, um, and then we had an issue, um, oh, we've, uh, we've actually got emerg emerging digital data in July, which should, um, should include our Council Connect. Now, unless we want to bring that forward a little bit, or um, are we happy to wait until July? No, I think, Chair, this is another one where it might be good that you wrote a letter on okay. that, because there are clearly, um, talking to councillors in the private session before, um, the experience of that is hit and miss. And um, whether it's a last line of defence or last line of what we can try and get some action that that just needs to be clarified I think it's not quite clear different councillors are having different experiences and I think if you could encapsulate that 
because I think the officers want feedback now rather than waiting yes. until July if, if something isn't working or isn't mm. meeting the expectation. Yeah. And then obviously we will discuss it in July anyway. Um, so hopefully, if anything, it does need adjusting, then that will be done by July and we can get a, an update. And then we have procurement policy, the annual update. Um, Oh, so we still have management of the property estate, and I think on that, Andy, what we would, what we wanted is just to make sure that that everything you had put in process was just m moving towards the goals, as we were looking at specifically the rentals and the income generation from that. Yeah. So yeah. We build on the kind of performance dashboard that we went through around yep. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, so um, what about we put that in July? Is July workable? Yeah. yeah. So if we pop that in July, that's going to be a, a proper good <laughs> long meeting. Um, parental leave policy. So maybe we can schedule that for September. This was the, this is an update on the parental leave policy that we passed, actually it was last year now, but um, is that all right for everybody September? I'm not sure how we can get it in anywhere else, but that's okay. And then we're obviously we have the um, parish charter. So in September, then we're looking for um, parental leave policy and parish charter. Everybody's agreed with that. Is it? Yes, Councillor Singleton. Sorry, this is probably still getting going back a bit. Um, the Community Contribution Fund progress report in January. Very much look forward to it. Um, this is such a good initiative, and it was approved for a one-year pilot. And some months ago, we asked for um, input to see how it was going and how it could be fine-tuned perhaps and it really worries me that it's coming to us for the first time when the year is almost through and anecdotally there's quite a lot of word out there people who would like to have contributed but were unaware of its existence and things like that there are there are lessons to be learned and i would hate to see it be shelved after its one-year pilot because actually it wasn't done very well. I mean, maybe it has been done well, but we don't know whether it's been done well or not. Anecdotally, there are people who would like to have contributed and didn't get the chance. And I, perhaps we have sort of failed, or perhaps I have failed to keep a thumb on it and try and get it into the, into the, the program rather earlier in the piece. But I, I, I do wonder what we can do, whether it's something that we could have a small written update or, or something like that, or um, whether there is any indication that it may be more than just a one-year pilot at this stage, if there's enough success there that it looks like a continuing initiative. Well, at one of the meetings, I think it was the last meeting, Andy, I asked the question, 25,000, is it worth it? And the categorical answer back was, yes, it's definitely worth it. So. Um, on that basis, I was making an assumption, always dangerous, I know, that we were going to continue with that. So um, that was my assumption anyway. Yeah, um, but in, advance of the, um, in advance of the meeting um, in January, would it be helpful to have a status update in terms of exactly where we are now with the, um, you know, the contributions, the award process, etc.? So, yeah, we can give assurance, yeah. Well, it was done at council, but I don't know if it was delegated to officers there, thereafter. The, the pilot was agreed by full council to continue the fund. Um, I think um, to keep it simple, I'd incorporate a recommendation to um, extend the fund into 22-23 into the budget report. So it'd be part of the recommendations of the budget report to continue. 
So that means it would come to the 15th February meeting, council meeting, and then it would be taken over for, um, by the officers, so we would delegate then as a council to the officers. Does that answer your question? No. Excellent. Yes, sorry Chair, so a new, a new proposal, actually I haven't had a chance to kind of sound with anyone, but I just wondered, there's something that's come up recently, a quite extensive filming project in our, our ward, and the, with quite a lot of disruption to residents and impacts, and there's been a lot of inquiries about charges level for filming and what the council um, gains from this type of um, event, and I just wondered at some point in the year whether we can have a report on... Um, filming the, the income from filming and also the income from uh, events in our parks because we this is something we've brought up several times and have not seen a, 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 any kind of change in the level of events even though we've um, raised concerns about it so it's kind of two things that are linked really charging in those two areas and what, what in, they involve a lot of officers time inconvenience for residents and what income are we generating from these two activities so actually probably what we would really like to see is the return on investment because that's the important bit and how much does that um, add to the coffers would that be something that we could look at in a meeting if we can put that on the to-do list please mark and then we'll have a look at it and schedule it into the work plan. Because I think it's contextual. If people know that there is a bit of disruption, but there's a, there's a good return on it, I think that's, that it's just puts it in context for people. And there's a lack of transparency on that return, really. You know, we no, can't we great. Can't explain it. Yes. Like Absolutely. Days, mm. some, okay. Yeah. But we should be able to do some form of return on investment, taking out officers' time and... Yeah. Etc. So, if we could manage to do that in our forward plan, that would be great. Does anybody else have any items that they want to bring up now? No? Lovely. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Andy, um, for staying the distance. Um, and um, our me next meeting will be on the 10th of January. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Sorry, a bit early. We're finishing at 5.59, so congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah.